Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for another year. Today, as we begin a new year uh, with all sorts of ideas and thoughts and, and desires, our, our desire really needs to be to focus on you and to worship you and live for you and do what you want us to do. So that's our prayer, Father, that we're obedient to you. One of the things that you've told us to do, to do is to uh, proclaim you to the world. And so this morning, as we uh, continue in our series on tactics, this morning we pray that we would learn just a little bit more about how to do what you want us to do, how to enter into conversations, how to engage folks. And uh, Father, our desire is that you would be honored and glorified by our lives and and by this this church and what this church stands for. Thank you for the blessings that you give us. Thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, this morning we are in session four, almost halfway. This is the suicide tactic. It's not that you go out there and commit suicide in trying to make your point, but it kind of is like that. So, any questions or comments before we get going? Yeah, uh, that's the that's the intent of the name so that you understand the concept when we're done. But you don't go out there with, a, uh, with an S-vest and uh, kill yourself. That's what Muslims do. Okay, no questions, comments? Let's go. Hi, I'm Greg Hochul for Stand to Reason, and welcome back to our tactics training. Uh, this is our fourth session together, and uh, the first three sessions we used to, to learn about tactics in general, but especially to uh, cover our game plan. We have the game plan fully in place. We know there are three steps to that. The game plan uses the Colombo tactic, which are, uh, is a tactic that uses questions to move forward, okay? Uh, the first step of that game plan is to gather information. We're going to use some form of the question, what do you mean by that, all right? The second step of the game plan is to reverse the burden of proof. And we're going to use some form of the question, now how did you come to that conclusion? Uh, the last time we were together, we talked specifically and in detail about the third step of our game plan, and that is using questions to make a point or using questions to lead somewhere. And so you have to have a target in view. You have to know where you want to lead the person, okay? And your questions are going to be like arrows that are shooting at that target, okay? Uh, in that third use of Colombo, though, the way we want to use questions is to help the other person to provide the pieces of the argument that we want to use to make our particular point. And so we're going to use questions to draw that person out and get those pieces on the table because if they put the pieces on the table, they can't take them off very easily. So we want them to help us. Once they got those pieces on the table, then we can move for forward with our argument. And uh, we talked about a number of examples um, uh, that we use to do that. So you have to know the argument that you want to make. You have to know the pieces that will get you there. And then you use questions to get your friend to place as many of the pieces on the table as possible. And those are the parts that lead to the conclusion, of course, then you finally use the pieces to make your point. Here's the second thing we learned when we were together last time. We learned how to improve your Colombo skill. And I told you to keep in mind three words, anticipate, reflect, and practice. And the point here is that the best time to improve your skill is when the pressure is off. And that's either before um, a, a, an encounter with somebody or after an encounter. So you can anticipate beforehand what problems you might encounter, figure out how you want to approach that using questions, and then role play it or practice it beforehand 
or sometimes you get involved in a circumstance, you don't do that well, and so you reflect back on what you just did and you try to figure out, gee, what are the ways I could have asked questions better or comported myself better in that kind of conversation? Uh, and by doing that, it helps to make the whole process more natural when you're actually engaging a person in the future. The third thing we dealt with was how to defend yourself against Columbo when it's used against you. And I said to do basically two things. Um, when somebody starts asking you questions using Columbo number three, in other words, they're trying to lead you to some destination and you're not sure where that's going to be and it's making you a little nervous, you stop the advance. You see, it sounds like you're asking the questions because you're trying to make a point. And that kind of confuses me a little bit, so I'd rather you didn't do that. And then what you do is then you regain control by then simply asking the person to make their point. Make the, give your point of view and give me your reasons for it, and then I can, I can think about it, okay? Now, what this does is it takes the tactical advantage away from them, which is what you want, and it puts you back in the driver's seat, but it gives them an opportunity to make their point just the same. Okay, so in this session, we're going to do something a little different. We've got the game plan in place. One of the things that uh, we want to do with the Colombo tactic is help exploit a weakness or a flaw. And there are different tactics to help you do that. And so today I want to talk to you about the first tactic that will allow you to exploit a weakness or a flaw. It's actually a very powerful tactic that will help you identify a certain type of common mistake that people make in their thinking. And I call this the suicide tactic, okay? Uh, I'll explain what I mean by that shortly. These are called basically self-refuting claims or ideas or arguments. Um, the next thing I wanna do is I wanna, I wanna help you to be able to spot points of view that actually commit suicide so then you can use the tactic on it. Then I'm gonna give you uh, lots of examples to show you how to use the suicide by using the Colombo tactic. We're gonna use questions to make the point that some people's point of view self-refutes or commits suicide. Um, and this I wanna underscore here, we always want to use questions whenever we can, especially when we're trying to point out a weakness or a flaw. Look at, think about it. If you were gonna to try to point out somebody's flaw in their thinking, they are naturally gonna be defensive about that. They don't wanna admit that their view is wrong in some way. So you wanna come in gently, uh, as low a profile as possible, and you wanna get as much of their help as you possibly can. And so you're going to use questions to get their help, just like we talked about using Columbo number three. Uh, the last thing that I'll do after I talk about the basic suicide is I wanna describe a unique variation of suicide that I simply call sibling rivalry. And that'll make a lot more sense when we talk about it. Uh, let, me, uh, let me talk a, a bit about what a self-refuting claim is. Uh, you're all familiar with this because you've run into examples of it and you see the problem, but we haven't really thought about it. And since we don't think about it too much, then we can't, can't make intentional use of the tactic. So let's, let's think about it. The suicide tactic makes a capital of the tendency of many erroneous points of view to just self-destruct when given the opportunity. Now, these self-destructive views are commonly called, as I mentioned, self-refuting statements or arguments. Um, and because these arguments kill themselves, you don't have to do a lot of extra work. Your job is just to observe that it's this kind of problem and then point it out to the person. Uh, I'll give you one example. This comes from a Peanuts cartoon, but I thought, oh, this is a perfect example of suicide. And you have uh, Sally coming into the room and uh, Charlie Brown is sitting on a chair uh, watching TV. And Sally comes in and announces, no, that's my new philosophy. I don't care what anyone says. The answer is always no. And Charlie Bla Brown, completely nonplussed, says, so that's your new philosophy, huh? And she said, yes, it is. I mean, no. And then she pauses. Oh, you've ruined my new philosophy. What had he done? He had essentially used the suicide tactic on it because the seeds of her point of view's destruction were built into her view. 
And this is something that's really critical. It's already there. All you have to do is see it. For example, somebody says, I cannot speak a word in English. Well, if he says that in English, of course, it's self-refuting because there he is speaking English while he's saying that he can't speak English. Okay, obviously false. How about this? There are no sentences more than five words in length. Well, that sentence itself is more than five words in length, so the sentence turns out to be false in virtue of self-refutation. It commits suicide. Um, okay, here's something you might have heard. You can't know anything for sure. Okay, this is the, the skeptic's point of view. The problem is the skeptic is pretty sure that he's right about that. And in, in the spirit of Columbo, you might ask, are you sure about that? And the minute you ask, are you sure about that, the point of view just simply falls apart. Now, let me tell you why these things work. Every statement that you make is about something. Now, sometimes statements include themselves in what they refer to. So the statement, all English sentences are short, um, is about all English sentences, and since it is an English sentence, it is also a statement about itself. Now, that particular um, uh, way of putting it is not self-refuting. It's false, but it's not false in virtue of self-refutation because uh, all English sentences are short is a short sentence. But how about this one? I mentioned it a moment ago. All English sentences are sentences that can contain no more than five words. Ah, now you got a suicide because you've got an English sentence that is making a statement about English sentence, sentences and it doesn't satisfy its own requirement. And so when a statement fails to satisfy its own criteria for validity, it is self-refuting. Let me say that again. When a statement fails to satisfy its own criteria of legitimacy or truthfulness or validity, then it's self-refuting. Simply put, a suicidal statements cannot satisfy their own standard. And this is why the minute a person utters that kind of statement, it becomes false. Now, it's not always obvious. Um, sometimes they appear true at first, but even when they appear true, they're still false. And your job as a, as a tactician in this situation is to try to recognize when the suicidal claim actually is suicidal and then just point it out. And if you can point it out with a question, all the better. Now, uh, this can sometimes be tricky. Um, I remember the, the very first suicidal statement that I was aware of. I was listening to J.P. Moreland uh, lecture, and he was talking about uh, a conversation he was having with someone who said, you shouldn't be pushing your morality on me right now. And as Jay's relating this uh, encounter, he says to the other person, well, I could be mistaken, but it seems to me that you're pushing your view on me right now. And I'm a student in this class, I'm taking notes, and the light went on for me. I had never seen that. I had heard the statement many, many times, but it never occurred to me that this statement could not satisfy its own requirement. The person was doing the very thing that they were abrading J.P. Moreland for doing. Their view committed suicide, and he just casually pointed it out. Now, he didn't use a question in that circumstance, but he did make it clear that the person was doing what he was telling J.P. Moreland not to do, and then implicitly the view committed suicide. And when the light went on for me at that point, I gained a new ability, and, uh, and maybe for you, this is the time you're gonna gain that ability. I gained the ability to begin to recognize self-refuting statements. I knew I would never be taken in by that other one again when somebody says, well, you shouldn't be pushing your morality on me. I'll never be taken in by that because now I see it. I see the problem. And you will too next time that comes up. But it also gave me a sensitivity to, uh, to other self-refuting views. And here's another way of kind of deciding or discovering whether somebody's point of view is self-refuting. If the exact same reasons used against your view are also reasons 
that defeat the other person's view, then the view is self-defeating. It, it commits suicide, okay? And if you want to recognize a, that a point of view commits suicide, I, I guess you can take a couple of steps. I'm going to mention these steps to you, but I, I have to be honest with you. The, when I go through this, I'm not going through steps in my mind. Um, I, I've gotten to a point now where the steps happen kind of automatically and I can see it. Uh, and that's probably will, what will happen to you. But let me give you the steps anyway. The first thing you do is you identify what the basic premise or the basic conviction or the basic claim is. It's not always obvious. And this is why your first Columbo question is going to be really helpful. You want to get that claim crystal clear. And the second thing you want to do is just then ask, does that claim apply to itself? So, um, for example, when somebody says you should make moral judgments, the claim is it's wrong to make moral judgments. But the claim itself turns out to be a moral judgment. And uh, the word shouldn't in that sentence is kind of a clue. That there's a moral judgment that's going on here. Now, when you ask whether the, the claim applies to itself, it may apply to itself and not be self-refuting. Ju it, it just depends on the circumstance. If it turns out that the claim does apply to itself and it defeats the original claim, well, then you've got a self-refuting situation and you can take the next steps to try to point this out to the person that you're talking to. Now, there are a lot of ways um, that common views actually commit suicide. Some are really obvious and, and they're so obvious they're a little bit funny when you think about it, like this one. I never, never, never repeat a word, never. Okay, you see all the repetitions of the word never, obviously self-refuting. But how about this? There is no truth. Now, people say this all the time. And uh, it, it might be uh, beneficial to ask what they mean by that, because they could mean a couple of different things. But some mean that there just isn't anything that you can know with any confidence. There is no truth to know, or there's no way of knowing the truth that is out there. Okay? But then I have a question for them. Notice the Columbo. I say, really? They say, there's no truth. I say, really, is that true? Now, what are they going to do? If, 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 they, <laughs> if they say, no, it's not true, then it's not true. <laughs> if they say that it is true, then it's still not true because it's an example of a truth itself and therefore it's self-refuting. You see how that, that works. Ever see this one? This page intentionally left blank. Not anymore, I guess, right? I had a friend who quipped once, I used to believe in reincarnation, but that was in a former life. Okay, so that might have taken you a few seconds to get, right? Some, you may be chuckling, maybe not. You're wondering, wait a minute, say that again. I used to believe in reincarnation, but that was in a former life, okay? So in this case, the suicide is just a little more subtle. Sometimes you have to think about it for a moment. Um, and there are other times when the contradictions are, are, are more hidden. Um, this would be an example that seems pretty obvious because of the nature of the example, but it, it, is, it still is a case where the contradiction is hidden. My brother is an only child. Well, that's self-refuting because the notion of brother entails that there's another sibling, right? So the brother couldn't be an only child. Um, but you might have to think about that. How about this one? Always go to other people's funerals, otherwise they won't go to yours. That's a Yogi Berra comment, you know. And, uh, well, you think, well, there's kind of a, he's got a point, kind of, but if you think about it, it is like self-refuting. Once you're dead, you're not going to be able to go to anybody else's funeral, okay? Notice that in these cases, the contradictions are entailed in the statements, even if they are not clearly expressed. And that is the kind of suicide that you're usually going to run into when you're having conversations with people about spiritual things. So you just got to pay attention. A lot of the self-contradictory notions that you, you become aware of are, are probably going to be notions that other people help you to see are contradictory, just like J.P. Moreland did with that particular comment that was made in that class. So I, I got a picture of that. I'll be giving you some examples in a minute, and these are things you probably have heard before, but you are you never realized that they had a self-refuting element to them. But now I'm teaching you, so next time around, 
you'll know, oh, that's right, this is self-refuting. How can I approach that in a productive way in this conversation? But I think as you get better at this, as you get more alert to this notion, uh, you will be able to spot self-refuting notions on your own. And that's always a great place to be because there are lots of ideas that are self-refuting in subtle ways. And if you get onto them, uh, you could be effective in undermining uh, a person's confidence in their particular view. I had, uh, I've been doing radio for a long time, uh, interactive talk radio, and I had been dealing with some people in the public domain, people have, have published in the public, and their ideas were bad theologically. And so I was challenging the ideas, but also since the, pub, the person writing had done it in public, their name was public, I felt it's legitimate to publicly correct them. So I'm mentioning the names of the people that, you, that the listeners should beware of because of the content of the writing. And I had somebody call in and they were really upset about this. And they said, well, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be correcting Christian teachers on the radio. That's what the person said. Now, I'm just going to pause for a moment. I want you to think about that. The caller tells me you shouldn't be correcting Christian teachers on the radio. So what was my response? My response is, if that's what you believe, then why did you call me? That is, why did you call me on the radio program to correct me publicly about things that I wasn't doing right? You see, they were doing the very thing that they were telling me not to do, okay? So I used Colombo there to kind of make the point that their point of view was self-refuting. Let me give you another example, and uh, this is of the same um, species as when somebody says you shouldn't be pushing your morality on me, but I'll, I'll show you how it worked out for me in a conversation that's a little longer. I was having a conversation with um, a gentleman, his name was Gil, and a really friendly conversation about, about spiritual things. And then uh, he asked me a, a question about it, an ethical issue, and I, I, uh, I gave my point of view about it, and he was, he, he was bothered by that. He said, you know, you, you Christians, uh, you're really nice people uh, most of the time, but eventually uh, you start judging people. Okay, now that's what he said. Now, you, you can see implicitly that his point was that I shouldn't have been doing what I was doing. And the thing that I was doing that I shouldn't have been doing was judging. But the minute he says that, now I can see it immediately that he's just made a big mistake. And probably, probably you've seen it too now. Uh, possibly before the session, you might not have seen this, but now you see it. Okay, he's judging me, right? So, so I said to him, Gil, um, what's wrong with that? So I'm asking, I'm just trying to bring him on a little bit more. I want him to state his moral view very crisply instead of just implying it. And so he said, it's wrong to judge. Now I got it. Now I got the statement. It's right there on the table. He can't take it away. And so I said, Gil, if it's wrong to judge, then why are you judging me right now? And I wasn't belligerent when I said it. I wasn't angry. I was just saying, oh, gee, golly whiz, why are you judging me, you know, kind of thing. And that caught him by surprise. And, and he stopped and he started thinking about it. And I could, I could just see him kind of working it over in his mind. And he's going through, oh, no, that's not going to work. Um, see, what? Finally, he says, well, I guess it's okay to judge. I was judging you. I guess, I guess it's okay to judge, okay? Uh, but he wasn't ready to give up. He said, you shouldn't push your morality on other people. Once you do that, then you've crossed the line. Now, he thought he'd improved his situation. Had he? No, not a bit. I had another question for him. Now, this is Colombo number one. I want to get a clarification before I move forward. He said it's wrong to push your morality on other people. So I said, Gil, is that your own moral point of view? that it's wrong to push your morality on other people. And he said, yes, it is. And he said it so blithely, like he didn't see what was coming. He had gone out of the frying pan into the fire. He didn't know it. So I said, then why are you, why are you forcing your uh, moral point of view on me right now? Notice his view committed suicide, and I'm using Columbo in a question form to exploit that. Now the ball's in his court. 
Now what's he's, I could have just said, Gil, you're doing the same thing that you're telling me not to do. You're judging me and you say you shouldn't judge. Okay, so now I'm preaching at him and I'm accusing him, all right? This is not a good environment. But if I use the Columbo questions to essentially make the same point, it changes everything. So now I'm, 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 uh, I'm throwing the ball back into his court. Is the pressure on me? No, the pressure's on him. It's his turn to talk. You know, and he, he, he made a couple of false starts, you know, trying to fix his problem. And he got all frustrated. And finally he said, you know, it's just, it's just not fair. I said, what do you mean it's not fair? He said, well, I can't, I can't find a way to say it in which it sounds right. He thought I was playing a word trick on him or something. I said, Gil, it's, it's not a word trick. You're doing the very thing that you're telling me not to do. Okay, the claim, the charge, the accusation was self-refuting. Now, I, sometimes in conversations I've had with people, I got to this point, and then they say, well, now you got me all confused. And I say, no, you were confused when you started. <laughs> you just now figured that out, okay? So there's another example of, of, of recognizing a point of view that commits suicide using the Colombo tactic to exploit the problem, okay? Um, I had a student that came to me, she was an anthropology student, and she wanted to be a missionary, but she ran into trouble um, in her anthropology classes with her professor. Um, because what she said, to, what her professor said to her essentially was, uh, you know, she was okay with her Christianity, but when she found out she wanted to be a missionary, uh, well, then th that, that didn't sit right with the professor. The professor said, it's, it's wrong for you to try to change other people's religious viewpoint. Okay, now you, do you see the problem? I, I bet you that you do now that we work with this a little bit more. Uh, the student didn't see it. And she said, what do I say? I said, you go back to your professor and ask a question. When the professor says it's wrong for you to change other people's religious viewpoint, given that Christianity is an evangelistic religion, we have the Great Commission, you might ask her, are you now trying to change my own religious viewpoint? See, there's the question. Now, what's the professor going to say? The pe she can't say, no, I'm not trying to change her view because she is trying to change her view. No, she's stuck. She's been able to silence then the professor in a nice way by uh, showing that her point of view is uh, contradictory and self-refuting, has committed suicide, and, uh, and she's able to deal with this problem. She comes to me for an answer. The answer was right there. It was simple. Now, you can see when um, points of view are self-refuting, then you can just use a question to demonstrate that. It'll be a big help to you. How about this, this one? All religions are equally true and valid. Uh, this is the point of religious pluralism. It's the view that almost everybody holds today, unless they're an atheist. And even many Christians, yes, I'm a Christian, they would say, I'm a follower of Jesus, I believe in Jesus, he's my savior. But that doesn't mean he's gotta be your savior. You have your own religious view, that's good, that's equally true too. Now, if you're a Christian saying this, just stop saying this. All right, because th this is nonsense. Um, if Jesus really is your savior, he is only your savior because he is first the world's savior. And if you need Jesus to be saved, the rest of the world does too. So if Jesus saves you, in fact, then others need Jesus to save them too. And if others don't need Jesus to save them, then you don't need Jesus to save you. So either you're right or you're wrong about your view. And if you're right, then everybody needs him. If you're wrong, then nobody needs him, even you. And you're believing in Jesus contrary to fact. And you're just wasting your time. But there's, this half and half business doesn't work. Okay, so just a little aside there. If you're a Christian, don't say this kind of stuff. This undermines the, the force of the gospel we're, it, it, we're entrusted with to communicate to other people. All right, but let's just uh, see this challenge as a, a challenge that in some ways is self-refuting. If all religions are equally true and valid, that would mean that Christianity is, is true, that the basic concepts of Christianity are true and valid and legitimate. But when you look closer at Christianity, one of the things that Christianity teaches is that Jesus is the savior of the world. He is the only savior of the world and all other religious views taken as a whole are distortions are falsehoods that are keeping people from the truth. So how could that be? 
either Christianity is true and others are false, or others are true and Christianity is false, or maybe they're all false, but they can't all be true. They can't all be true because they have, for, for another reason, they have contradictory and conflicting truth claims. God can't be personal and not personal at the same time. I mean, that's just, uh, he, if he exists, he's one or the other, but he can't be both. He can't be neither, actually. He's got to be one or the other. So religious pluralism fails as a point of view because it's self-contradictory, okay? Uh, it's self-contradictory in a subtler way than some of the others, but it commits suicide nonetheless. And when you see that, you want to find ways to exploit it by making, uh, making the point, pointing it out, and if you can use questions, uh, then, then all the better, all right? Now, this next self-refuting notion is one that I guarantee you have heard many, many times, and it has never occurred to you that it is self-destructive, that it commits suicide, okay? And here's the statement. You can only know what has been proven by science. Other stuff you might guess at, you might have beliefs about, you might have, have uh, faith in other religion, but that's not knowledge. Science gives you knowledge. All the rest just is in a whole different category, all right? Well, this is a very popular view, and it comes a lot of times from atheists and even people who are not atheists. Some people who are religious will say the same kind of thing. Science gives you knowledge, and religion and philosophy, they give you, well, you take those things on faith, but you can't know them. All right. The only thing you can really know has been proven uh, has has been proven by science. But I want you to see something. This statement is about knowledge, right? It's a st th that knowledge must be scientifically proven to be real knowledge. But it's a claim itself that uh, purports to be true. That the person who uses it says they can know. So. The only way that the, a person using this can be safe from having this being self-refuting is if he can give you scientific evidence that the statement, only things known by science can be, can be trusted or whatever, is an actu actually true statement. If he can't give you scientific evidence for that, well, then the, the view is self-refuting. And guess what? There is no scientific evidence for that view. That is a view that you take before you come to the scientific project. It's an assumption that's being made, but it is not one that's proven by science itself. So therefore, it is a self-refuting statement. Now, one thing that you might say in a cer circumstance like that is you might ask your first Columbo question regarding that statement and uh, uh, get a clearer idea of what they mean. Let them spell it out. Fine. And then you can say, now I'm confused. What are you confused about? Well, you just told me I can't know anything for sure unless it's been proven by science. Now, I get the feeling that that's something you believe is true. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Okay, well, uh, I'm confused because you haven't given me any scientific evidence for the statement you just made. And wouldn't you need scientific evidence for that statement to make it true? Okay, now the guy's stuck because there is no scientific evidence supporting such a statement. The statement itself is self-refuting. It turns out there's all kinds of stuff um, you need to know before science can even begin working. And you have to have knowledge that your sense perception is reasonably reliable. You have to have math principles that you put into play. You have moral principles like tell the truth in your research that's got to be in, in the box, so to speak, as truths before science can begin working uh, finding any other thing that's true. Okay, here's another one. Um, I was reading a newspaper article during the election cycle, and it was a political argument, but it was really directed at the religious right. And what the headline said was, God doesn't take sides. And then the advertisement went on with more information there. And I looked at that, and immediately it struck me that this was self-refuting. And I'm not, not sure if you've uh, seen it yet or not, but... Um, the person who says God doesn't take sides, I think, presumes that God agrees with them on this kind of question. That is, yeah, I, God, I don't think God takes sides. And that's what God, God does. It's actually a, a statement about the, God's nature, so or what he does. So obviously God doesn't take sides, okay? So here's the question that I would ask. Is that your view? 
that God doesn't take sides. Oh yeah, of course it's my view. That's why I said it. Okay, do you think it's also God's view that God doesn't take sides? Yes, 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 I just said that. God doesn't take sides. So that's the kind of response you're going to get. But then here's the close. Then what you're saying is that God is on your side on the issue of whether God takes sides. Is that right? And of course it is right. So apparently God does take sides after all. Just another example of a self-refuting statement. Now, I told you I was going to talk about a different type of suicide that, um, that I, call, I, I call a sibling rivalry, okay? It's a, it's a unique way that at least part of a person's objection gets defeated by itself, all right? Um, sibling uh, rivalry happens when objections come in pairs that are logically inconsistent with each other, okay? If a person utters two objections in your conversation, which objections are inconsistent with each other, then their point of view uh, commits sibling rivalry suicide, okay? Now, it doesn't mean that both objections are false, but it does cut your task in half if you point it out. You can't have it both ways. You can't say this and say that at the same time because they both can't be true at the same time at the same time, okay? And so um, you talk to them. Here's the way this came up for me. The first time I was having a conversation with somebody in a restaurant and the non-Christian was saying, look, all morals are relative. It's just a matter of individual point of view. There's no objective morality out there. There's no, no grand view of right or wrong. No God up there saying, here's what thou shalt, thou shalt not. Uh, none of that stuff. All you have is individuals making their own decisions for themselves about what's right or wrong. And, and that's just, uh, all you can say. And of course, you can see why that point of view is um, hostile to Christianity because the concept of right and wrong is pretty big, right, in the Christian worldview. So they're trying to undermine the claims of Christianity by just deferring to moral relativism. Now, you could say, you know, what do you mean by that? How'd you come to that conclusion? Those are all good questions. I want to skip that part right now because I want you to see something else. A little later in the conversation, this same person said, well, if your God exists, why is there so much evil in the world? Now, you may not be aware of this, but let me just point it out. There cannot be evil in the world if morals are relative. You either have objective or absolute is what some people would call it, moral standards that are all over everybody that a whole bunch of people are violating, creating evil in the world. And then you can complain. You can complain about the evil in the world and, and about God's, that's one complaint. And I understand that complaint. I'm not going to solve that right now, but just notice that the complaint itself requires that there's evil in the world and there's evil in the world that requires that there be objective morality. If there's no objective morality, there's no laws over everybody, there can't be any breaking of the laws over everybody. So if you're a moral relativist, there cannot be a problem of evil. If there's a problem of evil, then moral relativism is false. But you can't have them both. And that's what this person was trying to do. This person uh, had views that were in sibling rivalry. They are fighting with each other. They had to sacrifice their relativism or they can sacrifice their complaint about evil, uh, but, they could, but they couldn't hold them both. And one thing you'll find is a lot of people, they, 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 want it, they want it their way at one time and then the opposite way at another time. They just don't want to be consistent. And it's appropriate for us to hold their, in a sense, intellectual feet to the fire and, and have them be honest about this, okay? So that's a type of a si sibling rivalry. Um, Richard Dawkins is a famous example of this where as an evolutionist, he, in other writings, mentions this. He doesn't believe in objective morality, yet when it comes to um, the God of the Bible, he's got all of, he's got this tirade in one of his books against the God of the Bible, you know, as being a terrible God and a, a wicked God is his point. Well, look at those things are in rivalry here. One last example here. I, I was lecturing at USC uh, Law School once, and uh, a student, a law student came up to me, and she said, she said, well, I'm an atheist, and I'm an animal rights activist, okay? And I told her, well, I, I, I think you're going to have trouble trying to make sense out of those two terms in the same sentence. And she didn't understand why. She said, well, I believe 
that animals have a, have a right not to suffer. And I said, and I believe that I have a right to half of your income for my organization. And, you know, she blinked a couple of times and I said, what's the difference between our two statements? You made up a right regarding animals and I made up a right regarding, uh, you know, money I should get from her. Okay, rights aren't the kind of thing that you can make up, not real rights, not rights that have any weight to them. <clears throat> rights are given by God. And if there is no God to give rights, then all we're doing is expressing, expressing our preferences. So you can't demand rights for animals as a transcendent obligation upon human beings if there isn't a transcendent lawmaker that makes sense of those rights to begin with. You see, she had never really thought about it. She was a USC law student, but hadn't thought about the connectedness of these, these particular things, rights and the God who gives rights, okay? Um, and so consequently, her challenges or her point of view, general point of view, suffered in virtue of sibling rivalry. So I first, uh, in our conversation, asked her, what is a right? A right is a just claim to something, a just claim to something. It is not just a claim to something. It is appropriate, just moral claim to something. And then I asked her, how could there be such a thing as animal rights or any rights if there is no God? That was the line of questioning that I've offered. So always be alert for arguments or views that self-destruct. If you can see them, they're easy to deal with because they destroy themselves. You just uh, have to point it out. You ask your own self the question, does the position being offered also argue against itself? And when you discover that your friend's view is self-refuting, then you could just ask a question that exploits the problem and then let him sink his own ship, all right? So here's what we uh, covered in th this particular session. We learned the nature of a self-refuting claim, views that commit suicide. Uh, suicidal views express contradictory concepts. They are the contradiction is built into the notion, and therefore they're dead on arrival. I mean, they commit Harry Carey. Uh, you don't, they don't need any help from you, except that you just simply point that out. The second thing that we learned is uh, how to recognize when someone's view self-destruct, uh, destructs. And, and we talked about um, identifying the basic premise or the conviction or the claim. It's not always obvious, so we gotta do some thinking here. We have to second ask, does the claim apply to itself? And finally, we, uh, you have to ask yourself, does the, uh, does the claim self-refute, okay? Uh, and after that, after we'd laid that out, we looked at some popular examples of self-refuting claims and then ended with a little talk about the sibling rivalry suicide, the, the concept that um, two points of view held by the same person are in conflict with each other. And that at least allows you to get rid of one of those. Um, homework for this time. I think what I'd like you to do is just be alert this week to points of view that self-destruct, okay? Um, be prepared if you're in a group to, to share those things with some of the people in the group. Uh, but take an active stance to be alert for things that may be at odds with itself and use the steps that I described. Uh, next time we get together, we'll talk about uh, another way that arguments go bad. I call that way taking the roof off, and we'll describe, describe that tactic next time we're together. See you then. Okay, any questions? There was a lot of information there. And I would uh, I would recommend reading his book Tactics. Yeah. Um, it's an excellent uh, resource. This uh, this session he followed the uh, the workbook follows the video the closest closest of all of them. Yeah, he doesn't always follow. No. 
Right. And, you know, we're, you're used to seeing, okay, we talk about A and then we talk about B and then we talk about C, but on the way he's, he, the, the first few sessions where you would get the information, but it wouldn't be A, B, C, it'd be A, Z, B kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. I see someone posted. I don't know who uh, uh, Disc Jones twenty three error is, but uh, they say pray for me, would you? So let's remember to do that. And my sister says I would appreciate prayer for herself. My tongue was injured during a dental appointment, and it's making eating and talking painful. So many things I could say right now that I won't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to. You're talking is painful to other people. That's a question. Okay. Yeah. So, let, let's pray. Father, thank you for men like Greg Kokel and the insights that he has, and for the. Uh, the training that he's put together and how that may help us in uh, dealing with folks around us. Father, I don't know what's, uh, who, who is uh, Disc Jones 23 error. I don't know who they are. I don't know what's going on with them, but they asked for prayer. Father, you know. You know exactly what's going on there, so we, uh, we, we do that. We, we, we pray for them that you would uh, deal with them in whatever situation they're in, and uh, if they need to know you, that you would bring someone alongside them to uh, introduce them. If they're struggling physically or financially or whatever, that you would uh, uh, bring someone along to uh, to help them and encourage them, and uh, and that you would all ultimately receive glory for that. For my sister and the dealing with the injury, that you would just uh, cause that to be a speedy recovery. Father, thank you for this new year as we think about what you have for us, as we anticipate where you want us to go, what you want us to do, that we would always be obedient and that we would always look toward you. Thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.